My name is Anna. I'm a senior and one of this year's leaders of Riot. Hi, I'm Sammy, and I'm also a leader of Riot this year, and I'm a junior. Um, as this year's leaders of Riot, we are honored to introduce Dr. Monique W. Morris. Riot Club aims to confront issues at the intersectionality of race and feminism, as well as to give girls of color a voice on campus. While we work locally, Dr. Morris has enacted great change in communities of color across the country. Her work embodies the goals and values of Riot here at UHS. We are proud to share the news that Dr. Morris is the recipient of the 2020 Distinguished Alumni Award, UHS Alumni Honors. Dr. Morris has spent her career shining a light on institutional bias and racism, identifying and documenting ways communities of color are adversely affected by government and social policy. Along the journey, she has been a tireless traveler, educating others who are finding their voice in the discipline of social justice on how to affect change. Her work is intersectional and holistic, urging us to look up from the page and see the bigger picture. The, deg the degree she pursued after UHS make her uniquely qualified for this work. Dual Bachelors of Arts from Columbia in Political Science and African American Studies, Master of Science degree in Urban Planning, also from Columbia, and a Doctorate of Education from Fielding Graduate University. Leadership roles with such influential bodies, such as the NAACP, the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the Berkeley School of Law, and the California Subcommittee on Reducing Racial and Ethnic Disparities have amplified her voice. Her TED Women Talk in December 2018 is climbing toward two million views. She is a prolific writer, widely published in academic circles. Her four nonfiction books, including Push Out, written in the vernacular, harness the power of storytelling to reach anyone interested in her work. Too Beautiful for Words, a young adult novel about sex trafficking, is accessible to the very girl she is working to protect. Her work rose to the national stage when Massachusetts Congresswoman Ayanna Presley hosted the world premiere of Push Out and soon after introduced H.R. 5325, the ending punitive, unfair, school-based harm that is overt and unresponsive to trauma, otherwise known as Push Out Act legislation to end the punitive push out of girls of color from schools and disrupt the school to confinement pathway. Through it all, she embodies UHS's core values of inquiry, care, integrity, agency, and interconnection, and serves as a role model for our entire community. Please join us in a round of applause for Ebony's mom, Dr. Morris. So I know that many of you have been sitting for a little while, so one of the things that we like to do after we show this film is just give everyone a chance to ground in your breath. So if uh, you all could just join me and we could have a couple of collective breaths uh, to release some of the tension you might be feeling after watching this film, um, the invitation is there for you to do so. So if we could sit comfortably in your seat, ground your feet, Take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. In and out. All right. So this is my first time coming back to the UHS community, not as a parent, um, in a little while. It's been probably about five years since I first came to talk about the book push out. Uh, and share that I had just written this piece that talks about the ways in which black girls are uniquely experiencing discipline in schools in ways that um, have gone under the political radar. Um, it is and has been uh, quite a journey for a little book. I, I call this my little book that can, right, and is. And so in many ways um, it has grown from uh, a simple labor of love and something that I was very passionate about sharing with the world um, to a film, to a piece of legislation that is working to end it, um, and 
countless new organizations and community projects that are working to dismantle some of these structures in real time in communities across the country. So I'm really proud of the community that has come together to talk about these things. I'm really proud of UHS for screening this film with you all. Um, oftentimes when people think about these issues, they tend to think about only public schools. Uh, but I know from experience and from other uh, engagements that the, many of the issues I'm talking about in this film um, happen in independent schools, parochial schools, uh, as well as public schools and charter schools. And so um, the opportunity to have some conversations with you about uh, what we're doing and why we did it, um, I, I cherish. And so um, I'm not going to get up here and give you a lecture because you just uh, saw the film and I can certainly do that, but I would like the opportunity to just engage in some conversation with you all. Um, if you have any questions for me uh, about this project and uh, where it's going, where it's been. What do you think are some of the um, important laws that need to change in the coming years? Um, and other more general steps in terms of, um, of legislation um, to change some of the problems that you addressed in, in the film? Actually, I didn't start with this, but this week is Black Lives Matter at School Week. And so it is um, an important time for us to be having conversations about this. And I don't, I don't know even if um, you know, that was part of the consciousness in pulling this together, but it's uh, serendipitous, and so there it is. <laughs> but, but I think um, the legislative responses that need to be in place um, create a structure for there to be systemic change. That's one of the things that I say all the time, is that for those who are engaged, um, you know, certainly this is a film about education. Um, and not everyone in here may be an educator professionally in their futures, though some of you will be. Um, but this is also something that should be on the minds of those who will be in policy work, who are in the legal domain, who are medical professionals. All of the issues that we're raising in here cut across uh, industry and sector uh, and profession in that way. Um, so the legislative responses have been tailored to the educational domain, largely, to explore what kind of infrastructure is in place to dismantle some of the things that we see as being unnecessarily punitive. Um, but even where there are these federal efforts to try to say, okay, let's you know, build out a more robust continuum of alternatives, let's think about restorative programming, let's think about social emotional learning, let's think about all of these uh, very specific ways that we could you know, sort of chip away at the culture of punishment that has been dominating much of our rhetoric and, and practice in schools. Um, we also have to think about where we invest our money. Right? We put our money into putting more police officers in schools. We put our money into uh, creating structures where there are uh, you know, security guards and uh, metal detectors in schools, security cameras. And while some of that we recognize as a function of where we are in the society, you know, we, all, we either went to UHS or are now at UHS where we don't have these systems of surveillance moving through our schools. We don't have uh, a policing of our bodies in ways that tell us we can and cannot wear certain things in order for us to be available to learn. And so, you know, the fact that not everyone has access to that basic um, way of engaging is problematic to me um, because I know that schools like UHS have it, right? <laughs> and, and I know that how you come to school should be a function of your readiness to learn, not what you look like. And so, um, and so, you know, I think the, the, the policy you know, conversation that we're having at the federal level is, is largely about creating an, an, a, a space for there to be other state and local policy efforts to intervene as well. Um, I'm hopeful that the Ending Push Out Act will become law. Um, I'm hopeful that states will replicate what is in the bill uh, in terms of its investment in the teacher training and professional development as well as uh, a dismantling of the infrastructure of punishment in schools. I'm hopeful that uh, much of our conversations about policy will also impact our practice. California already has on the books uh, a policy that says that we should be exhausting all remedy uh, or that we should be engaging in alternatives to exclusionary discipline, the suspensions, expulsions, et cetera, that we see um, in, in ways you know, before, before we go there. Um, but we don't always do that. So just having the policy doesn't mean it's going to automatically translate to an effective practice um, and outcomes. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and in many ways, we're still raising awareness about how this uniquely impacts um, black girls and, in California, Latinas. 
and indigenous girls. And so it's really important to think about uh, the communities who are impacted by these policies uh, discreetly, um, uniquely, um, and collectively. All the speakers we've had here when they embark on their work sort of had, had defining moments in their lives where they had to just say, all right, this is what I want to do. Have you had that? And more importantly, I think, what have been your biggest challenges doing this? Because I could imagine, you know, there are certainly people who are not as empathetic to what, you know, the school to prison pipeline and all that. Um, and I know this because I know certain people who are like that. So I just want to, you know, get your thoughts on that. I don't know that there was necessarily a defining moment because I grew up a black girl in San Francisco. <laughs> so for me, conversations about equity um, were swirling in my household from my earliest memories. Um, I do think that uh, there, it, you know, as a person who cares about data and as a person who cares about justice and equity, um, I saw a lot and recognized that, uh, you know, probably about 10 years ago, that girls were experiencing something that uh, society wasn't ready to talk about. Um, that much of the investment, the hundreds of millions of dollars that had been invested from philanthropy in the conditions, they were trying to improve the conditions around men and boys of color, um, was pretty overt in its disregard for the conditions that were affecting girls of color. And so, um, you know, like, like many of us who just are agitated by injustice, I just felt like this is not right, and so I will not be quiet until we start to see some shift. Um, and luckily, I had a community, uh, a crew, uh, that, of folks that were equally as passionate about making sure that our girls are seen. Um, I am the mother of two girls, and so that certainly plays a role in trying to facilitate a community that will respond to them differently than it has responded to people of my generation and, and prior. Um, but I do think that, um, for me, this is part of an ongoing effort to elevate the value of black lives, um, to, to examine the structures of inequity that continue the harm and to create space for there to be a real healing effort. Um, one of the things that I hope you take from this film is that it's not just a deeper articulation of the problem, which is easy for me to do, right? I could spend days and days and days, film after film after film, talking about the problem, but also to try to address how we begin to confront some of these things that um, I think are, are capable of being dismantled. Um, you know, it, we, we like to think of these things as big, heavy issues because you know, racialized gender bias is a big, heavy issue, right? Poverty is a big, heavy issue. Exploitation is a big, heavy issue. Um, the, you know, colonized way in which we think about and deconstruct the vestiges of slavery and historical oppression, those are big, heavy issues. But what we know we can do is begin a process to reconcile and build connection that can facilitate healing. And if we commit to that healing, then we can commit to changes in those structures. People make structures and policies, right? They don't just create themselves, we create those. And those of us in this room who have access to this tremendous education, who have access to resources, we will be creating those policies. We will be driving that conversation. Um, you know, when my daughter was here, and even as I was here, I don't think I recognized it as a student, but I definitely recognized it as a parent. I was like, you know, UHS does a great job with a lot of things. You're going to get an amazing education here. I got a great education. I also know that UHS is a place where people will grow up and run things. So because you're going to run things, because you will be leaders in your industry and leaders in your practice, it's important for you to be exposed to the ongoing hard work of wrestling with those and confronting those uh, personal biases, the ways in which you can either participate in oppression or work to dismantle it to create a more equitable society. And so, you know, for me, it, um, you know, is really ultimately about that. Um, thank you for being here, Dr. Morris. Uh, one of the things I'm really grateful for in your film is that you amplify um, adverse childhood experiences. And uh, that's something I think a lot about outside of here and also while I'm here. And the conversation around adverse childhood experiences or ACEs tends to be focused on the pediatrician's office. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's important to start thinking about it in schools as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any wisdom around how we can be thinking about 
um, what you talk about in your film as all the things that a student has to do before coming to school yeah. and what our responsibility as educators is to uh, meet that student where she is um, with regard to trauma. Um, the conversation about ACEs in educational spaces and in schools has largely been um, associated with, number one, administering the survey with a trusted care professional who can help guide the conversations around childhood trauma, but also building out spaces that do not intentionally trigger that kind of trauma, um, where there, in many ways, are, um, you know, again, the policing of bodies and uh, enforcement of dress codes for girls who are survivors of sexual violence can be very triggering. Um, there are ways in which uh, you know, the structure of surveillance is triggering um, in communities that have experienced violence at the hands of law enforcement. To have them patrolling the schools then is uh, a trigger. Um, and uh, it relates to the behaviors then that people, young people, are engaged in, um, which they just you know, are doing because the brain is doing what it's supposed to do, which is protect you from harm. And if you perceive harm, then you will act accordingly. Um, it's one of the reasons that I've had conversations and do a series of professional development pieces with educators around schools becoming locations for healing and that taking place in order for learning to occur. Um, if young people don't feel safe, then they can't learn. Um, and so, so many young people uh, are not feeling safe that they're engaging in behaviors that either disrupt their own learning or disrupt the learning of others. And so, um, that's something that um, I think is an important consideration for those of us in this space, um, not just for educators who are working with young people, but also for young people to be aware of your own triggers and to be uh, aware of where you fall along that continuum of, uh, of at least being able to assess childhood trauma. Um, one of the things that we've learned from our work with girls, and I think it's said in the film, is that when girls have some capacity, and, and so the one thing about ACEs is that um, girls tend to have higher scores than boys across racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so when girls are experiencing higher levels of childhood traumas and when um, you know, their ACE scores are higher uh, than their counterparts, um, it's important to you know, explore then what they need to have a school that feels safe to them. So constant uh, revisiting around what safety is, is really important. Um, and being able to hold that space for each other. Um, you know, you, uh, UHS is a unique community where you have uh, affinity groups and you have clusters and you have spaces that um, hopefully facilitate community in ways that I have not seen in every school um, that can also provide a space for you to just sort of hold moments for each other um, and have conversations about responding to childhood traumas. What I value from the medical community, particularly from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, you know, our current Surgeon General, is that um, she is really adamant about the capacity for all of us to be ACE buffers, right? And so to think about not just naming that you have childhood trauma, but also understanding that we can be buffers for each other, that we can increase our own resilience in spaces, is really important to the healing, uh, you know, framework um, that I am trying to advance. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's definitely part of um, the emergent conversation around trauma-informed schools. But those of us in California who are clear that trauma exists um, want to push the conversation a little farther, so that it's not just about uh, trauma-informed schools, but it's about healing responsive spaces as well. So that you're not just naming the trauma, but you're also intentional about healing. Now, this film is about black girls, but I'm sure many of you could connect with different issues that were raised along the way. And it's, um, it's always in, an interesting thing for me to go into spaces where there are not a lot of black girls and talk about black girls. <laughs> um, and so it is important, I think, for all of us to recognize, uh, and really the call to action here is about recognizing the humanity and exploring the ways um, that we can show up for each other um, to create more equitable spaces. Um, this is not about pathologizing black girlhood. I hope that's clear. Um, to be a black girl is a beautiful, wonderful thing. But it is also not without its uh, challenges given the dynamics in our society that um, unfairly uh, police or render our cultural acts, um, exploit 
our brilliance um, and cultural contributions. Uh, and you know, that's, that's a difficult space to manage. And so um, I just want to invite you all to think about ways in which you can, as a student, um, but certainly as you move through life and consider the professions that you'll be engaged in, um, how you might show up differently, how we can participate as you know, uh, folks who are committed to justice uh, in, in the most promising way. Um, Martin Luther King has one of my favorite quotes around justice where he says, you know, and, and this interrogation of power when he says that power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And you know, justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So this work is really about how we use our power to correct everything that stands against love. If policies and practices have been created out of a culture of fear, um, it's our duty then, if we claim to be committed to justice, to correct those things so that they are more aligned with the spirit of love than fear. So that's you know, my invitation to all of you um, as you debrief and discuss and really think about what's next um, is to think about whatever it is that you want to do in life, however you show up in the world professionally or personally, um, to think about opportunities to align actions, um, a grieving of some of the uh, historical legacies of oppression that may have benefited you, um, some of the things that you might have found surprising about why girls are fighting and why they're getting in trouble, things that may um, you know, shake your own consciousness around some of these things and just explore how um, you might then align some of your own practices um, and learnings to, uh, you know, more deeply interrogate how you want to show up in alignment with love. How much work do you have in working with kind of those sectors in terms of um, uh, schools that have success in terms of like graduating students, but not in a particularly healthy way. You know, again, part of what we do in this work is to invite people into a deeper exploration around biases and actually deconstructing what it means to label um, one's practices as successful. Um, I, I do think that in many ways in the educational space, graduation becomes part of the numbers game. Like, are you graduating? How many people? 100% of our students graduate and go off to college. You know, all that stuff that is really important, but doesn't necessarily um, you know, really engage in a conversation about whether students are actually ready for college, um, what readiness means, and whether they have been able to successfully um, navigate some of the conditions that may lead to underperformance in their level of higher education or other emotional, social emotional harms um, that come along with that. Um, you know, my, my feeling is really just that if we really work to um, repair, this is about, you know, we talk about re restorative justice a lot. Um, I don't know if that's been a part of the conversations here, but a lot of the schools that are trying to dismantle some of the more punitive responses to um, student misbehavior talk about restorative justice. And it's really about shifting the narrative on understanding when harm has been created and restoring relationships or repairing relationships or repairing harm. Um, you know, the sort of core understanding around restorative practices is that you identify the harm, you figure out who was responsible for the harm, and then you figure out what is needed to repair the relationship in response to that harm. Um, my feeling is that we have not done a good job of engaging in that process when it comes to looking at uh, institutions and communities where that institution might have been part of a tapestry of harm uh, in the lives of that community or the multiple generations that have been interacting with um, this institution, right? Or not this particular institution, but you know, with the institution in question. So a lot of what's happening, I think, nationally, locally, um, our conversations with educators, with parents, and with young people about whether the school has been part of a tapestry of harm, and what that means, what it's looked like, and what's needed to repair it. I don't move in cookie cutter spaces. Um, I think that safety is co-constructed, and so, and, and by that I mean that you can't bring in an external body to create safety. You have to work 
to build relationships to create that kind of safety. So that even if there's something that goes wrong and there's conflict in this space, which every school has, right, that because you're in community, you can confront that and move together to repair the harm. Uh, and so that means, of course, you have to admit that there's harm, right? You have to understand that, you know, maybe we did participate in part of this culture of harm, or I did say something that was harmful, or I did engage in a practice that was harmful, or I didn't, or I'm part of, or I'm, I be, I've become an agent for an institution that is harmful and has been harmful um, in, in your space and community. And then acknowledging that and then working together to reconcile that, I think, is critical. So then for, uh, as you're just talking about like personal harm and personal trauma and how that affects children in schools um, and specifically black girls as like most of that was about, um, how do you like, I guess how do you and I guess like kind of your movement as a whole, how do you address like families, um, I guess regaining kind of trust in like academic institutions and in their own children and kind of balancing like, how much do I trust my own child's experience and how they're interacting with other children at school versus how do I trust like the institution itself and what it's telling me about my child? We acknowledge always that for many native communities, uh, you know, the school represented a complete disruption of one's identity um, where a lot of folks, particularly in California, you know, which was newer to uh, the colonial experience than folks on the East Coast. Um, you know, indigenous families were torn apart by the boarding schools, and so school represents something harmful. Um, I talk about in Push Out, uh, you know, the book, how, you know, enslaved Africans were um, physically harmed if they tried to learn to read, um, that because reading was uh, sort of the signal that one was a thinking human, uh, the rhetoric around dehumanization of people of African descent by those who were enslaving and perpetuating the structure of an institution of slavery, um, you know, wanted to make sure that black people didn't read. <laughs> so um, recognizing that history and uh, acknowledging that history is really important, um, especially when we, you know, sort of today talk about literacy rates among these communities and we talk about you know, some of these conditions as if they operate in this ahistorical space, which is not true. Um, you know, I think repairing the harm, you know, as I said before, with the restorative approach and this thinking about healing really has to begin. It has to begin with an acknowledgement that harm is a thing. It has to begin with one saying, or one institution or one policy saying, we were part of the harm. I hurt you. And beyond an apology, which is always like, okay, thank you, but with any apology, you want to see action, right? You want to see a change of outcome. Uh, you, so with, with the acknowledgement has to be, you know, there, this, this, this commitment to uh, what is needed to repair the harm, but that has to be created in partnership with those who are harmed. So much of our discussions with community, especially in educational spaces, are the schools saying, we are here to do our job, and the parents are there, parents come to the school, we'll talk to you here in our space, and if you can't make it, you know, we might send you an email or a letter home, and you know, if you get to it, great, if you don't, we're moving on with what we said we were gonna do. And a lot of that is because of the way that the schools are accountable to other systems and have to make sure they're running. But when we talk about repairing trust and repairing harm with families that might have had multiple generations harmed by schools, I've seen situations where multiple generations have been harmed by the same school. Like just generation after generation going to the same school because they never left the community. And each time the harm gets more entrenched because there was never this acknowledgement that there was harm to the great grandmother or to the great grandfather. And so the children come to school like, these teachers don't care or I don't care. <laughs> so if somebody calls me out of my name, my parents said I better do, you know. And they do that because there's no trust um, and there hasn't been this conversation um, about building trust. We are really in the early stages of, I think, trying to figure out how to build more robust parental engagements around that, but I really do think that if we follow um, and, and really begin to explore what it means to build out locations uh, where, where schools can function as locations for healing, 
that then when we invite parents in, it's more than just I'm here, I have to go up to that school because I have to either advocate for my child or you know, be in conflict somehow with the school or I have to go because my kid is you know, doing something. Um, you know, it, it becomes a more deep um, relationship uh, that we haven't really cultivated in a lot of spaces around the country. So, um, you know, the conversation, again, is just beginning. I think it has to include those parents and communities um, in unique ways around how they have been harmed and what they feel they need in order to feel safe to come back and be in community. But, you know, so much of our rhetoric these days is divisive. So much of our um, way of engaging with each other is to ignore the historical traumas. Um, and I just think that's not a useful exercise. I think that if we're gonna talk about um, really moving to a space where we are a community, then we have to engage um, with a sense of love and union um, that will be challenging. We're, we will not agree on all things, right? Um, we do not agree on all things, and that should not be an expectation, but there should be an expectation that we hold certain things as dear and fundamental to our ability to coexist and be in and, and to be together. Um, and learning institutions have not historically had that kind of rigor. Um, and that's one of the things that we're hoping to bring in this conversation around schools as locations for healing. Um, I'm wondering how students can support attempts made by institutions to create systems of restorative justice. Um, the first thing is certainly to try to have an exploration with um, adult administrators and educators about what currently goes into place when there's conflict and how um, there is this discussion about um, ways to repair harm. The, typical modality that's used in restorative practices is the circle, um, where folks will come together, the person who's been harmed, the person who's responsible for that harm, and their sort of community of advocates and uh, friends, adults, um, who can help uh, sort of think through what might be possible in terms of repairing harm and repairing relationship. Um, and the circle, you know, is a practice that uh, comes from some of the indigenous practices around, um, you know, certainly the usage of a circle to um, equalize one's uh, engagement so that it's not set up like sort of in a typical contentious way where I'm on one side, you're on the other, but really thinking about us in community. Um, and that has been, you know, I think what is most widely used in schools along with, you know, sort of peer courts. Um, and some other sort of mock legal spaces that I think um, do less uh, restoring and repair of relationship and still sort of operate in semi-punitive ways. <laughs> so it's really important in conversations about restorative justice or restorative practice in schools to be mindful of the true intention, which is to repair community. And where there was not community to begin with, to transform the relationship. So some people take issue even with the term restorative justice and really think about it as transforming justice or transformative approaches. Because if we didn't have a relationship to begin with, how can we repair anything, right? We're forming a new relationship and we have to be honest about that. So I, I would always say you know, that it's important to start conversations. It's, it's important to read uh, about restorative practices. It's important to think about different modalities for healing and repairing relationship. Um, a lot of what my contributions have been in this space, in addition to being an evaluator of restorative justice programs, is to think about then what it means to repair harm um, in different communities. So some places are using restorative dance or using dance as a way to restore one's relationship. Or if uh, spoken word is a part of your cultural tradition and engagement, how do you then repair the relationship with yourself so that you can repair relationships with others um, if there's been a deep disruption? Um, whatever it is that works in a particular community should be, I think, student uh, driven in the sense of really recognizing what it means to repair relationship and having um, elevated conversations about that. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time.